Hello and welcome to the Beat Cancer Answer, brought to you by BeatCancer.org, the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. We believe that 90% of all cancers could be eliminated through environmental and lifestyle choices alone, and science agrees. Unfortunately, most people don't know it, so we provide the education that can help you prevent, cope with, and beat cancer through diet, lifestyle, and other immune-boosting approaches. On every podcast, we will feature an expert who can teach us how to become part of that 90% who could prevent getting diagnosed with cancer. If you already have cancer, we have empowering information for you too. Over the past 35 years, we have helped thousands of cancer patients get back into the driver's seat when it comes to their personal journey of healing cancer and preventing future reoccurrence. Listen today as Debbie Melamed interviews Vern Verona on the 10 essential traits of a self-healing person. Today we are speaking with Vern Verona. Vern is a renowned keynote speaker, health educator, and author. For 40 years, his lectures, workshops, and media appearances have motivated thousands of people to take better and more conscious care of themselves. He uses humor, insight, and practical science to improve and enrich the lives of many. Byrne studied traditional Chinese medicine and nutrition at the East-West Foundation of Boston, Massachusetts, and was the nutritional director of a popular Beverly Hills medical group for five years. He co-created the ODDS program, which is Off Dangerous Drug Safely, a dietary and lifestyle program designed to reverse pharmaceutical drug dependency. The guidelines are featured in his published books. His first book, Nature's Cancer-Fighting Foods, has been revised in 2014 to reflect his new information and is jam-packed with great things. Uh, His second book, The Macrobiotics for Dummies, is part of uh, the informational popular dummy series. Vern's Vern's website, www.vernvarona.com, offers information on his counseling services, books, lectures, articles, downloads, and a regularly updated blog. Today, he is going to speak with us about the 12 essential traits of a self-healing individual and how we can develop the 12 traits that people who have healed themselves share. We will also learn what it really takes to heal and how to navigate the overwhelming waters of alternative solutions. So welcome, Vern. It's so great to have you with us today. Thanks. It's good to be here. This is really an exciting topic and definitely one that needs to be talked about more Uh, We we talk about food and things like that for healing, but we don't talk about the traits and the the psychological, spiritual side of it as much, so I think this is really important. Would you like to tell us your story and how you started counseling and what prompted you to write books and what got you into this area? Thank you. Well, um it's a really loaded question. Um, I, I got a lot to say about it, so let me give you a little brief bio, and um, and then I'll I'll get into our topic because the topic is a meaty topic. Let me just say about the topic. Um, I for years I counseled people being more food centric. I was just really concerned about what they're eating and how they're cooking, and you know I came out of a Japanese community essentially in Boston studying cultural medicine, which for our teachers was not so much cultural as it was Japanese because they were Japanese. But as I started teaching over the decades and started traveling more around the world and seeing that world patterns were very similar in many cultures like the Blue Zones, they all ate similar foods, grain, bean, and vegetable. Those are the three primary foods. As I started seeing that, I realized that there was really indeed a a universality about this way of eating and living that was based on many cultures, not just the Japanese culture. So while my initial intro into all of this is Japanese, I have learned to multiculturally, uh, multiculturalize it, culturalize it. And I did that by writing a book called Macrobiotics for Dummies, where I took the current idea of macrobiotics, which is a word that just means long life, uh, and said, this is not about brown rice and vegetables. This is far broader. And it has many, many cool principles that are from traditional religions and archaic ideologies, and they are really easily applicable today. And they include some information about diet. So it's real practical information. But in counseling people for many years who had cancers, um, I started to see that people who were not so 
food fanatic do much better than the ones that were being completely crazed and obsessed and writing down everything they ate and being concerned about all the minutia. And when I would go to cancer seminars, like um, cancer control groups and different alternative cancer groups, where I'd see thousands of people, six to 8,000 people over a weekend, many of them would come up to the booth that I was given to, to show my books there. And they'd say, I'm a cancer survivor. And I'd say, great, how long? And they'd say, 15 years. And I'd say, tell me, what do you attribute to your healing? And they'd say, well, I changed my diet, I changed my lifestyle, but I got out of that dumb job that was killing me. Or I got out of that relationship that was choking me. Or, you know, I, I decided I really wanted to paint and take pictures and nothing else was more important than nourishing my creative side. And that's what saved me. So it, it became fascinating to me to see that survivors were not only people that had taken more initiative and control of their health, and start changing their diet and their lifestyle, but they began to really look at different aspects of what was really stressing them consistently, what was really making them unhappy. And when they changed that, they got better. So what I realized was that there was naturally a body, mind, spirit paradigm. And for a long time, I was body oriented. So now I decided, let me expand it. Let me talk more about what the meaning of spiritual really means in terms of energetic. Let me talk about the psychology of stress and our the changing perspective we have that can allow us to be healthier. And when I started addressing those issues, I started seeing people do really well in their healing, sometimes reverse disease, sometimes halt to progression of, sometimes just make their transitions easier, less painful. So that's, that's what really changed me. That's really interesting, yeah, because you can tell someone what, what to put in a smoothie, but it's a little more difficult to figure out what brings you joy and to also figure out what needs to go in your life that's making you sick. Right, absolutely. And you said it, you said it, you said, what brings you joy? Now, right. before I get into that, let me just say, I'll give you the bio piece. Uh, I was, you know, at 13 years old, my mother died from breast cancer. She was 35. My father died at, even though they were separated, I was still close to my father. He died at 51 from liver cancer. About 40% of the people in my family died from various kinds of cancers and diabetes. So I was seeing nothing but disease growing up. I was a teenage actor. I'd moved to Hollywood uh, and I was, uh, I, when I was 14, I was acting in plays. I was doing some television and I was, you know, hanging out with an older crowd. And as a result, that influenced me strongly to, you know, be more aggressive in what I wanted to pursue and what I was doing. Um, and I decided that, um, actually, I, I, I will lose all credibility by saying this, but I became a circus clown. <laughs> <laughs> I joined, I joined Ringling Brothers and I, and I decided, you know, I was a Charlie Chaplin imitator. I wasn't really a clown. I was a Chaplin imitator. And I dressed up like Chaplin and I walked around the arena and did all that stuff. I did that for about two months. And then I realized that I just, my heart wasn't in it. I, as much as second nature it was to me to perform and entertain, I just, I wanted to study this medicine. And I think when I look back now, four decades later, um, you know, self-educated people always have a fear of never being educated enough. And people who are surrounded by sickness often have a fear of, you know, always being on the alert that they're going to develop similar symptoms. So I was driven by my parents' death and deaths around me to find a a more natural way. Because at the time, my mother was getting radiation and it was really clearly not working. And for many years, I became you know, alternatively staunch. I mean, I was, I was very strongly alternatively oriented and this is the way. And, and as I saw people get better, they weren't always faithful to alternative methods. And I realized one day I saw a car accident and I, I saw this guy being dragged out of the car and they put blankets under him and they were giving him some water. And I thought if I were that guy at that moment, would I want an herbalist or would I want to go to the ER? And then <laughs> I realized that, well, our medicine in the West, even though I've been bashing it for years, is crisis medicine. And it's an amazing technological medicine. And it has a place. Absolutely. It's for crises. Yeah, it's just for crises. And instead of saying, you know, creating a division of us and them in terms of the alternative camp, let's say, you know, we can use this judiciously for certain conditions or to halt certain symptoms. But the real issue is, what are you doing in your daily life that's aggravating your healing? And when I created these, it's actually 10 types. It was originally 12, and we reduced it to 10 to make it a little simpler because some of them combined easily. And I thought these 10 types of healing that I'm going to talk about are not just for healing 
disease. They're actually to become happier, to become more whole. Because when you achieve that, disease can't really flourish. That's been my experience. So uh, that's not to be simplistic. Health. Yeah, it's reaching yeah, optimal It's not health. to be simplistic because diseases, I've seen people with cancers, progressive cancers, who ate really strict alternative diets and actually got healthier, but the cancer progressed. Right. So it's really a matter of, you know, throwing everything you can at an early cancer uh, that won't really kill you in the process to do whatever you can. But the more I, I looked at this, the more I started realizing there are basically 10 things that people can do. So I'll get into them and feel free to stop me uh, at any point if you have okay. a question. But one of the first things I ask people when they come and see me, and I do Skype counseling, I do all over the world. Uh, I'm busy in a lot of Asian countries, actually. Um, which is a drag for time reasons because, you know, I have to cancel at midnight you know, or I have wow. to cancel early in the morning. Uh, like in India, it's 10 hours different. Um, but the first thing I ask people is, how can I help you? What, what is it you want? And it's really interesting to hear people say what they want because a lot of people don't think about what they want. They just say, I want to get better. But what is it you really want? It, you know, what do you want to change about your health and your body, your perspective? What are the factors that stand in your way? I ask people this. And they say, well, that's why I'm coming to see you. I say, no, you have an idea. I want to find out what you intuit or what you already know. What are the factors that you feel have contributed to your, your ill health or your instability or your weakness or your pain? And that's fascinating conversation to hear, too, because I learned that most people have an idea of why they're in the condition they're in. They don't know what to do about it. They don't know the proper strategies that can create a body without cravings for food that's not health supportive. They don't know what a good guideline would be because there's so much intellectual information out there. But they all have an idea of what's going on. So the first question I ask of the 10 questions is, what's meaningful to you? What, what kind of meaning do you have for your life? That, that mean, doesn't mean you have to have a big social vision and want to change the world. What's important? You know, and I did a film in 2006. We shot, I directed a movie, I directed and produced a movie um, called, um, it, was, it was actually about disease reversal. And one of the things we did was a man on the street interview in there. We had a number of funny bits. And it was fascinating. We never ended up using this, but I asked a, an old man, he was from the Lower East Side of New York. I met him in Hawaii. And I said, and this is where we shot the movie. I said, excuse me, let me ask you, what, what, um, what's your favorite treat? What's your favorite food? And he said, I don't have a favorite food. I just love what my wife prepares. And I said, okay, well, what is it she prepares? Oh, just, you know, healthy stuff. And I said, well, is there one particular dish you like? No, no, she just cooks everything for me. And I, I couldn't get anywhere with this guy. I finally said, <laughs> give me your breakfast. Tell me, what's your favorite breakfast? And he said, well, sometimes I have Rice Krispies and sometimes I have. And I said, right, then something hit me inside me. He said, Rice Krispies. I, I saw myself reading the box as a kid. And I said, you ever read the back of the box and you eat the cereal? He said, he just looked at me, he stopped dead in his tracks for a moment, and he said, yes, I do. And I said, you ever see that recipe for the marshmallow squares and the, you can make out of the Rice Krispies? And he said, my wife makes those. I, I, I love those. And suddenly he got really <laughs> emotional, and he started, his face became alive. This guy was dead until this moment. He became alive. And I said, what do you make yours with? He said, well, I do it very differently. I, I, I put, and suddenly if you took the volume off, you'd realize, this guy is really excited about something. And I, I realized when I get a client and they were talking about food and I see them really excited, I ask them what else in their life are they really excited about? And chances are, if they're so exaggerating their love and their passion for food, chances are that's prominent. And that's a problem because you need, to, in order to heal, in order to become happier, you need to find and discover things that really put you in the present moment for periods of time. That's what a passion does. Whether you're taking pictures, I'm also a photographer. So when I take a picture and I find something worth shooting, I, I forget there's no past, there's no future. I'm, I'm in the present moment and I am like living large in that moment. And that's a healing space for people to be in. So right, I'm all the stress hoping. leaves you. Yes, yes, that's the, that's the, it's perfect. That's the exact point. The stress leaves you. And because you're so focused and uh, I mean, you can get so focused that it becomes a stress, but that's the other extreme. But yes, I, I like to find out what is it. And, that, and I had a guy who came to see me with prostate cancer, and uh, I said, what are your passions? He said, I have none. And he was like brown street corner shoes. He had a conservative dress. He spoke in monosyllables. 
this guy was really boring. He had the personality of a doorknob. And I'm, I'm sitting there talking to him. And I said, Robert, I'm not getting anything from you. What, is, what, what, do, you, what do you like to do? Nothing. I work. You know, I go home. I eat dinner. And I watch TV. I said, do you have anything fun that you do? Well, sometimes there's a good program on. I said, no, no, Robert. Is there anything you do that you're really excited about? He says, well, not really. I had hobbies as a kid. But I, I said, like what? He said, well, uh, oh, I was really uh, I, Like what? Well, I, I used to make models. Models. And I made models as a kid, so I'm very hip on the models. And so I said, did you make planes or ships? He said, both. I said, did you make the planes and hang them with a nylon thread from the ceiling after they're done, after you painted them? He said, yes. I said, did you paint the parts before you glued them? He said, yes, I had them laid out on the bridge table. I was perfect. They didn't get glue anywhere. I used Q-tips for applying them. And suddenly he got into the conversation. And then I looked at him and I looked and I said, Two words that brought this guy to tears practically. I said, Robert, he said, what? I said, Cuddy Sark. And he just almost started crying. Now, when I was a kid in the 60s, the Cuddy Sark was a giant boat. I remember. A ship. Yeah, it was a ship. And a Ravel model company made it. It was like $15. It was huge. I mean, models were like 3 and $4. So to pay $15, $20 for a model, you've got to be wealthy at the time, in my thinking, or, you know, just really super creative. And he, as a kid, also longed to make it. And I looked at him and I said, get yourself the Cuddy Sark and make it. And he said, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm busy, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, those are days, of, and that was in the 80s, I counseled this guy. About six months later, I got a blood report from him. He sent me his blood work, which was perfect. Uh, cell counts were perfect. He had uh, prostate cancer, and um, he had some inflammatory condition as well. And everything was normalized after six months. And he sent me a picture as well of his bridge table and the cut he saw completed with a big note on the parlor, back of the polar that said, thank you. It's oh. <laughs> really, it's like this guy had suddenly a fire in him. He, he enjoyed that so much. He forgot the pleasure he had from sitting and focusing and, and being creative. And he kept thinking, I'm not creative. So I always want to find out what's meaningful to people. What do you like to do? Not just physically. I like to run. Okay, great. What else do you like to do? Uh, I like to dance. Okay, that's all physical. What do you like to do creatively? Well, I like to do crossword puzzles. I like to write. I like to write poems. That's important. So I always like to find out what is it that you stop doing. And chances are when people get sick or they start to weaken or develop uh, beginning signs of different conditions, they kind of lose enthusiasm for life. And they stop doing things that bring them joy. And they start focusing on the stress of getting better and what their symptomology is and it can become really difficult. So meaningful life is number one. Does that okay, make sense? That's, yeah. I mean, I picked up the guitar and I started playing and it brought me so much joy. And <laughs> you just forget about everything and you realize you're just in this wonderful moment. Yeah, you do. You do. I had an impulsive moment like that in Hawaii. I, I played guitar as a kid and I played double bass. and But I stopped years ago and I was in Hawaii and I was in a music store. I was gonna, wanted to get a harmonica. And after I bought one, I saw the employee playing the ukulele, and I said, do you have any books on Learn to Uke? You know, and he, he said, this is a great CD over here and this and that. And I said, great, and give me a uke. I bought a ukulele, and That's I started awesome. playing it. And it's been so cool to have that to play because it's easy. It's quick to learn, and uh, it just it gives me pleasure. You know? So, yes, we have to find out sources of pleasure. It could be knitting. It could be, you know, it could be gardening but something that brings us pleasure that we could do rain or shine indoors or outdoors. Okay. So that's, great. That's really critical. Number two is um, attitude. Attitude is really critical. And by this, I mean, what kind of perspective do you have? And this is really critical for many people because we're, we're involved in such deep, you know, knee deep blame in terms of the way we see things. We have perspectives that are very, very blame oriented and perspectives that lose scale in, in the larger gist of things. Uh, I always want to find out how people think, uh, how they blame. Are they accountable? Do, can you see how you have influenced the situation as opposed to this has been done to me? So it's really important because five minutes of the person in the conversation can give you an idea of, of how positive they are. If it's half full or half empty, it's like the old story. This is a terrible old story, but it's a quick one where these Two kids, uh, and it was a, a joke, I think, from years ago, but I, as I remember it, two kids, this, this, these parents have two children, and one's extremely negative and extremely positive. And it actually has become a problem. So they go to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist says, listen, 
I want you to, for the, for the Christmas this year, give the negative child everything he wants. Buy him untold amount of presents. And for the little one, get some horse manure and put it in a little box and give it to him because he's absolutely ridiculously positive. So they get, Christmas comes around and the kids got gifts all over the place. And the first kid opens up the, his gift and it's an electric train. He's the negative kid. He says, oh, great, I'll electrocute myself. He opens up the next present. It's a bike. He goes, oh, great, I'm going to fall and break my neck. I mean, everything he sees, he's, he has a negative spin on it. And the, the uh, positive kid can't find any of his presents. And finally, under the tree, there's a little tiny square box. And he gets it, he opens it up, and he smells it, and he touches it. And he says, I know there's a pony around here. <laughs> it, it just, it just brings great. your mind. It's like, it depends on how you look at things. And, and that ability to look at things is not just a self-enforced perspective. It comes from a sense of faith that you have, a sense of faith that, you know, things can't get worse. And if they can, I'm going to run it out so I can find something positive and, and, and a way to deal with this. What, what's the lesson from all of this? What's the gift in this? It's like crisis and opportunity, that a, a traditional Chinese character uh, of being both composed of both elements. So that's important. How yeah, that is very important. Goes. The old joke about perspective is this two shakes uh, meet uh, these two shakes. Um, these two guys uh, crash cars in the Golden Gate Bridge, and one guy gets out and points to the other guy and starts yelling, and the other guy screams at him. And before long, they're spewing obscenities, obscenities at each other in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge. You, you saw me, you son of a, you blah blah blah, and they're going back and forth. And meanwhile, 6,000 miles across the world in the Saudi desert, two shakes pass Rolls Royces on the road and lightly brush fenders, and they stop and they get out and they inspect the damage and they look at each other and they walk toward each other, and they extend their arms, and one says to the other, isn't it great that the Almighty has chosen for us to meet like this? Wow. Okay, it's fictitious, but the point is, there's always a way of looking at something that can be less injurious to your, to your health and more buoyant to your spirit. So we have to think about our attitude, and if we are negative, we have to really catch ourselves in it and bust ourselves in it and realize we're seeing things half full as opposed to, half empty as opposed to half full. It takes constant self-monitoring, but attitude is really critical. Maybe and, a, a you know, gratitude I, journal or... Yeah, a gratitude journal is really important. Uh, that was one of my original conditions, but attitude also is linked with gratitude. And, and gratitude means finding out what you're grateful for. You know, I was misdiagnosed with lymphoma in 2001. Now, I don't have lymphoma. I'm very healthy. I look 20 years younger than my age. I'm 64. And... Uh, you know, people are always making a big deal about it. Uh, and when I thought I was dying, I was told I had 10 months to live by somebody who looked at my CAT CT scan, saw that I had a mass in my chest and said, based on the size, based on the location being close to a aortic arch, we presume this is lymphoma. We can do some tests, but I've been doing this for 35 years. I know lymphoma when I see it, you've got lymphoma. And uh, we should do some uh, biopsies, and then we need to probably do some chemo and put you on the CHOPS procedure and this and that. They had a whole plan, protocol already thrown at me. And I, I remember thinking, like, wait a second. How do we know this is, this is true, in fact? How do we know this is my, my real condition? And it was frightening because they, they just point blank said, you've got 10 months to live. And what that did for me was it changed, immediately changed my perspective about time. Suddenly I thought, about time and how much I'd wasted or, or felt like it was wasted, how much I didn't do that I wanted to do. And I had a sense of profound regret about my life. And um, anyway, they found that it was not anything but a water cyst in my chest since birth. They drained it, they pulled it out. And he told me at that point that morning, we'll discover what it is, what kind of cancer you really have. It could be thymus, it could be thyroid, it could be any kind of cancer. Well, let's find out what it is. And they went in there, they made a little tiny half-inch incision horizontal with my rib, and they went in there and they, they, they punctured this tumor. And it wasn't a tumor at all. It was just a, a fluid sac, and they pulled it out and drained it. So he said to me, you know, we did a CT on you, and because of that, we saw solid matter. Had we did an MRI, which we really don't normally do of lungs, we would have seen that you had a, a, a water mass there. So no cancer, nothing. You're in great shape. Have a good weekend. But I spent six months. I spent six months thinking I was dying. And it was an wow. amazing experience because as somebody that's normally incredibly positive, I got so negative. I was getting pissed off at people I thought didn't come to my funeral 
in my idle thinking. You know, <laughs> I was thinking, I'll bet you he's not even going to come to my funeral, or she's not going to be there, or something. You know, and I, I thought, wow, why is carry this really far? And it put me in touch with a lot of other people. And I once met this really positive cancer guy. And I said, I remember I said to him, so how are you doing today? Because I was supposed to be counseling him. He didn't know about my dilemma at the time. And he looked at me and he said, every day, I, you know what I said? I said, oh, I said, how are you doing? He says, he says well, I'm doing fine. I said, well, it's real miserable weather we're having because it was in the middle of a rainstorm. And he said, I, I only see sunshine, man. I only see sunshine. And I said, really? He said, every day, every day above ground for me is a good day. And I remember thinking about that and thinking that that's, that's a great philosophy. That is <laughs> you great. Know. So if you yeah. want to be more positive, you can connect with positive people that have good attitudes. And I guess it starts to rub off. It does because you see it. And every once in a while, it's easy to retreat into a negative place. And that's okay to be there too. But just as long as you know, it might be temporary and there's other ways to look at it. So attitude's pretty critical. Um, and how we how we and how we allow ourselves to to go there and the self monitoring we need to do. Third thing is balanced nourishment. Now, in a nutshell, there's a lot to say about diet. I wrote a book. It's a popular book. It's called Nature's Cancer Fighting Foods, and it's by Penguin and Random House, uh, who have now combined uh, publishing companies. And I was kind of against the title at first. It was given to me by a publisher actually. Um, Nature's Cancer Fighting Foods. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized. I don't really believe there's or there are cancer fighting foods personally after 45 years teaching this information. There are foods that are called super nutrition foods or some foods like certain strains of mushrooms, which have shown that they can increase T cell, T cell counts or increase T cell activity so that we have a stronger immune function. Yes, there are some foods that can trigger uh, responses within our nutritional matrices in our body that can allow us a better, more comprehensive state of healing. But Initially, it's more important to find out what you have been doing that's weakening you before you go thinking, I want to do something for my cancer. You know, people are always saying, I'll go to a party. People say, what's good for, what's good for the eyes? I hear blueberries are good for the eyes. Or what's good for, you know, sore throat? It's, it's, like, it's not so much what's good for it. Let's talk about what's bad for it first. Staying up late will knock you out. It'll knock your immunity out. If you don't have regular good deep sleep before midnight, which is a circadian rhythm of understanding, Absolutely. you will suffer. You will suffer. So you need good deep sleep. Nothing is sugar. The amount of sugar weed is just prohibitive. It weakens us systemically. It creates inflammatory response in our body. It creates an insulin swing, which fosters inflammation. Uh, it eats up our mineral structures. It's so lethal. So people don't realize. And that's because they don't know what sugar is. It's a very strong concentration of a refined food and it's sugar cane and it creates in most at least in cane sugar it's concentrated to the degree of being three foot of cane that needs to be industrially refined to produce one teaspoon of sugar so if you're looking at a piece of cherry pie from the from the regular coffee shop and you make it a la mode with one scoop of ice cream you have approximately 10 teaspoons of sugar in the pie and a five teaspoons in the ice cream. You've got literally 15 teaspoons of sugar that you're going to eat, which is the equivalent of 45 feet of cane in the wow. course of maybe four minutes. I never minutes. knew that. No, well, we don't think about how concentrated. And what does that do internally? It does a lot internally. The biological mechanism that we know about what sugar does is been established and documented. It raises blood sugar, which creates a whole hormonal reaction with a number of different hormones. But more importantly, what it does is it creates what they call an insulin swing. It releases insulin to the system, and that insulin is responsible for inflammatory responses, immune weakness. I mean, orange juice was given to subjects in 1975 in a medical experiment documented in my book. A glass of orange juice, was a, a regular tall glass of orange juice was about 100 grams of sugar. And they found that that orange juice put our white blood cells to sleep for four to six hours. Now, that might be okay for a really healthy person, but if you're not healthy, you can't afford to lose your immunity. It's like the soldiers are leaving the fort. And then people will say, well, it's natural. Well, yes, it's natural, but it's still concentrated sugar. Well, it's fruit sugar. Yes, but it's still a sugar source without the fiber, highly concentrated. Right. Does that mean you can never eat orange. it? Yeah that's, a, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Does that mean you can never eat it? No. Better to have minimum amount of juice here and there and better to have the fruit with the fiber. 
And that's, you know, I'm not saying anything that's too revolutionary there, but yes, sugar doesn't support cancer, cancer healing. It doesn't support any kind of healing. Uh, it's nice because it can make us really numb sometimes, and that's a fun place to go to uh, because you don't think about anything else when you're eating a sweet treat. You're right there in the moment. You're, it's, you're, you're in your teeth, and you're, you're feeling the chocolate go over your gums, and you're, it's down your throat, and you're thinking, I love this. And, you know, you're, you're just zoned. And that's a great feeling. But uh, It's so fleeting, you know, though. It's gone so fast. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the word. That's a beautiful word. It's fleeting. It's so temporary. Uh, in the scope of things, it's, it's a blip. And you have to ask yourself, all right, that's about three inches of pleasure from the corner of my mouth to my throat versus the 30 feet of tubing it's got to go through and the reactions I have to go through biochemically. Is that worth it? But the real issue with sugar is not so much that we shouldn't eat it, but we should be mindful of the things that we do that make us crave sugar. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So balanced nourishment means understanding the major food groups have gotten really twisted in this country, in this Western civilization. The major food groups are carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Now, we all know all foods essentially have those those macronutrients. We just disagree on the proportions. And my background from the Chinese influence, from the cultural influences, show that we do need some kind of whole grain in our diet. Now, there's a lot of carbophobia going around with people saying, don't eat carbs, or people calling everything carbs. They lump everything together in one, one scoop. But the truth of the matter is every culture in the world ate some form of complex carbohydrates, such as whole grain. Now, I'm not talking about bread, flour, crackers, pasta. I'm talking about whole grain, like brown rice, like oatmeal, like quinoa. Those are whole grains. And what they do in the body is they bond to toxins and take it out. They regulate blood sugar. They have so many vitamins and minerals uh, on the hulls. Uh, we can't afford to de them and eat the refined versions. So that's what's missing in our Western diet. We need some grain. Do we need a lot? No. I think the macrobiotic system and a lot of you know, supportive grain, vegetable diets originally came out with recommending too much grain but we do need some grain in our diet how much grain maybe a half a cup to a cup a day of cooked grain oatmeal in the morning will set you up for a 24-hour bowel cycle so the next day it's much easier to have an elimination and that's really how we internally cleanse so the balanced nourishment idea is understanding i talk about this in my book carbohydrates fats and protein do we need a high fat diet i don't think so i think if your carbohydrate balance is off you're going to crave fat because fat kind of neutralizes blood sugar. So one, one begets the other. So what do we need to eat? I think we need to re- reduce animal protein. I'm a vegan, but I-, I recommend people reduce animal protein dramatically, not be dependent on animal protein. I recommend they're not dependent on sugar. They can have fruit and other sweets and occasionally a sweet treat of whatever kind of source. Fine, enjoy yourself. It's not going to kill you if you have a little bit here and there, but the overview is grain, bean, and vegetable. Beans, we don't eat in our culture because we don't know how to cook them, and we're really ignorant about how to, you know, why we need them. That's vegetarian source of protein. Very often you'll see people in the gym and they'll say, I need to eat more protein. And that always means I need to eat more chicken, fish, or meat. Right. We don't, we don't see protein as two-thirds of the world's population does in terms of beans and bean products. And one of the things that people get turned off to about beans is because they get gas. They don't know how to cook them. They don't know how to eat them. They don't know how to add salt to them. So let's say here, just to give you an example, let's say you have guests and you want to get rid of them really quick. Here's the formula. Give them black bean soup with pineapple in it. And boy, that'll give them gas. It'll make wallpaper peel. Why? <laughs> because, because the sugar ferments the bean quickly. So the oh, bean I doesn't see. get a chance to digest. So therefore, the only thing you really have to know about bean digestion is, number one, eat a small volume. Make sure you have some salt cooked into it. Not a lot, but some. And make sure that you don't eat something sweet at the same meal. Okay. So uh, that's important. That's but that's one of the reasons why we don't do these things. That's very good to know. Yeah. So, so, so balanced nourishing is the idea of eating carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in certain proportions that are more comprehend more compatible to the way we're designed we're not designed to eat a lot of animal protein we know that by our intestinal length by our digestive secretions by the kind of grinding teeth we have as opposed to tearing teeth uh, by our uh, stomach secretions um, by our nail quality 
uh, we don't have nails like most carnivores have. So there are a lot of factors that reveal we're not designed to eat a lot of that stuff. So excesses, of course, are going to result in some kind of imbalance. So balanced nourishment means, and, and then there's a supplement, by the way, the supplement aspect. Some supplements can be helpful, some not. First, you've got to get your diet together. And then if you have supplements in your diet, my recommendation is you have in your diet four or five days a week. Give your body a chance to sort of desupplementize two days, desupplementize, excuse me, one or two days a week so that you're not overloading it every single day. The answer is not in supplements. Supplements are an adjunct to your diet, I feel. Absolutely. Uh, and they have a place. I, I believe that also. Yeah, and they I like have that a place. two-day rest rule. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's important. Thank you. Um, they, and they have a place. But my concern is when I see people getting excessively crazy about supplements, I remind them that, you know what, the formula for health is really universal. If, if, if health is a universal quality that we are born with, then what will, the ingredients to achieve health should be universally acceptable and, and available to everybody, not just people who can afford you know, chlorella and bee pollen and imported honey and the uh, expensive mushrooms. Uh, it should be simple. So I, there's a sociological concept behind healing that, you know, what's available is really what can help you. Can other foods help you that are more concentrated? Yes, they can. And they have a place. But in a, in a, in a minimal sense, I believe. So that's a small but very large topic of balanced nourishment. Um, the addition of salt is really critical. I definitely suggest people not avoid salt. They need salt from the ocean. Moderately cooked into their food in small amounts. Um, so salt they, with the minerals, the pink Himalayan or salt I of color? Either, I'm picking, Himalayan salt is actually mine salt, frankly, because it's, they say it's from an old ocean bed, but I think we need mineral salt from the ocean. And the whiter, the better, the lighter, the better. Um, the salt I usually recommend is Fleur de Sel, which is uh, and a very expensive sea salt from France. It's the actually top layer of salt brine that they harvest which is highly mineralized, for the amount you use and for the quality, I think it's one of the best salts you can get. So salt That's that you can get from Baja, Mexico, from Portugal, and from uh, France uh, tends to be, I think, some of the best salts in the world. Um, I don't really use Himalayan salt. I tried, but I, I just haven't found it to my liking. Um, I'm going to look for so that. It, this, yes, there's, a, there's, some, there's a, a lot of choices beyond that, but we can get lost in the minutia of, of like which salt and what strain and how gray, how white. You can really get lost in that. We need that larger view constantly. Number four is healthy lifestyle. So what kind of lifestyle do you have? Do you have one that contributes to your health? I have a friend who sells homes in, he's a developer, and he sells homes in Central America. And they use all eco-friendly materials. I went down and looked at what they were doing, and it's amazing. They have beautiful eco-friendly materials that do not outgas. People don't realize that we are in a constant state with all the artificiality we surround ourselves with, with breathing in volatile gases that can influence our health, our pulmonary systems, and eventually our liver and organs of filtration. So we need to really rethink you know, our environment. You know, when I was a kid, we played with wood. We had wooden blocks. We had wooden trucks. That's a long time ago, but everything's plastic now. And when you go to those dollar stores, you get the cheapest grades of plastic you can get. Many of those toys are constantly being recalled because they're, those, those toys are still outgassing. And some of those chemicals have come off very easily in, in, in handling. So we have to be really conscious about what we do. And, and just as a word to parents, you know, because your kid likes a toy doesn't mean you have to buy that toy. Buy your kid a toolbox and teach your kid how to make toys. That's what I did. And it was Great amazing. Advice. It was yeah. amazing because it makes the kid's imagination go wild. You know, a three nails nailed into two pieces of wood that looks like a ship. Now it can be a plane. Uh, you know, you can have a lot of fun. So find ways to stimulate their creativity and their imagination as opposed to giving them a toy they're going to play with for 20 minutes and put in a toy box and that's going to be it. Um, because that's, that's critical, too. So that's healthy really true. lifestyle. Meet. The kids like the pots yeah, and the pans and things more than. Right. They're right. And, it's you know, true. And, and, and how, cre how creative do you get as a parent by getting down on the floor with your child and putting the pot on your head and, 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 and you know, and walking around with it or, 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 right. or throwing the ball the in the pot. with or, it and having fun. Yeah. Right, right. Just do something that's fun and inspirational. Um, I'm a grandfather, and my kids 
consider me one of their friends because I play. We just play all kinds of games. The other night, we played beauty parlor, and I had my granddaughter do my hair for me. And it was so That's fun. She, she felt so competent. She sprayed me, and, and she put goop on my hair. It looked absolutely terrible, but she put goop on my hair. And then she took a picture, and she put it on her Facebook, and all her friends thought, Wow, your granddad's really crazy. Uh, and it was just, it's just fun. It's just fun. We have to find different ways to celebrate all the time. And when you're with kids and you see that imagination quality, it's, you realize, wow, I haven't used my imagination in years like this. So it's all part of that paradigm of getting better, the, the whole looking, uh, the whole forward-looking paradigm. So healthy lifestyle is, uh, takes, takes also the appearance of not only your home, but what you do to support your health? Do you walk to work or do you get any activity? Sometimes people say, I am incredibly busy. But no, they don't get any aerobic activity. If you look at the exercise gamut, you have physical exercise such as stretching, weight development exercise, and aerobic, three kinds of exercise. The deal is we need all three types. We don't just need to work out. We don't just need to walk and do aerobic. And we don't just need to do yoga and stretch muscles. We need to do all of them. So we have to find time to do a little bit, if not a whole bunch, uh, consistently. And that's the problem. Uh, people have very little consistency, but it makes a huge difference. You know, Even before you go to bed, doing three or four yoga postures can make a huge difference in the quality of your sleep and the depth of your relaxation. So lifestyle means how we live behind that door. When you enter that home, is that your oasis of sanity, or is that another stress for you when you go home? You know, is, is it dark and dingy and unkept and disorganized? Uh, I mean, are you a secret hoarder? I mean, all that stuff is part of what gives us a state of health. So that's part of the whole picture. Um, <clears throat> number five is manageable stress. Uh, the state of no stress is what we call death. So we are all stressed. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a matter of how stressed are you? And do you carry that stress to sleep? Because the truth is, if you're really stressed, you're going to have stressful dreams. You don't, you're not exempt. As soon as you close your eyes, you're not exempt from stress. You just, stress just transfers into a dream state, which is stressful on your body. and You really don't get adequate rest. <clears throat> so we really need to look at our stresses and, and think, downsize or find ways to cope that are going to be less stressful and less ideal to what we might want, but overall more supportive for our health. Uh, I think stress can be really healthy. It's just we have to have the perspective about it that, you know, we have to eliminate unnecessary stress and watch how we create our own stress. Uh, Sense of humor. Oh, actually, uh, there was a quote from um, Bernard Shaw. He said, the beginning of a nervous breakdown is the belief that one's own work is terribly important. (laughs) <laughs> that's great it always struck me as a very humorous quote um, number six is sense of humor and a sense of humor is really critical and that doesn't, this doesn't mean we have to become funny people it means can we appreciate humor can we find humor in, in, in our own life you know, can we laugh at ourselves and can we laugh with others um, and that's the, that's the important thing and I, I do that often when I have a client I'll I'll show them pictures of me before I changed my diet. And I really don't have any because I changed at a very early age. But I had this picture of myself at a clay bath in Glen Ivy Hot Springs, California. And I, it was in a mud pool where everybody put just layers, packs of mud on their neck and their head. And it looked like I have tumors all over my body. So I look at, and I'm staring blankly at the, at the camera. And it took this very horrific looking picture of me, which everybody laughs when they see it. Um, so I show, I said, this is how I used to look before I changed my diet and lifestyle. And they start to laugh. And, and then I, and if they don't laugh, then I get really worried because 99% of people laugh when they see this picture. And when they don't laugh, I realize after watching people over the years, if you ever watch somebody not laugh, it looks like they're holding on from falling somewhere. They, they, they have a sense of, of not wanting to lose the moment because when you think about it, laughing requires that you surrender to the moment. Because when you laugh, there's no past. There's no future. You're not thinking about the rent that's due. You're not thinking about the guy you almost crashed into this morning that yelled at you. You're not thinking about the problems you're having with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or the rent that's due. And you're not thinking about stuff in the future. 
you're just in the moment and you're just laughing and you've got saliva bridges in your mouth and your and your tongue is showing and it's green and you don't care you're just it's whatever you're laughing at is funny and and that's what laughing really is it's a surrender to the moment and that's why laughing is really good <laughs> that's why you know in a sense laughing has shown to be nothing but immune enhancing to our body you know when we laugh um so i encourage people to do humorous things uh to go outside their boundary a little bit and stretch a little bit you know i i tell them to you know talk to people in elevators or I, just take a risk you know i think a calculated risk but, but nobody talks to anybody anymore you know talk to people introduce yourself um i went into an elevator one day and i was there was a, there was a six-year-old in the elevator and as it started going down i was like really i was like uh, 40 floors in the middle of Manhattan. And as it was going down, you could feel that in your groin. You know that you feel that tickle. Yes. And of course, no adult's going to say, I feel a tickle in my groin. Nobody's going to say anything because they're adults. But the kid said, wow, that felt funny over here. And he touched himself and everybody started laughing. And they started <laughs> laughing only because he was duplicating how everybody felt. So, so I think it's really important to, to be able to talk to people, to be able to find things that are have a sense of humor that that are funny um so stepping out of a comfort zone not being too serious yeah i mean sometimes we can't help because that's our condition but you know i I was talking about advocacy i did a medical group uh, a couple years ago and this before these on prostate oncologists and i i said um i looked at everybody and i said um i I was starting my lecture i was the only non-md on the, I mean, I've got 45 years in of study and, 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 and teaching and book writing, but I don't have an MD credential. The MD credential I had was from a Chinese medical association that went out of business and they were just giving them out after four years like candy. And they're actually kind of worthless that I have an OMD, but for, for the times that they gave them. Um, but they allowed me because they, I was popular and, and with their groups, they allowed me to be one of their speakers. And, uh, the first thing I said was uh, I got up there and they were all alone, like 1,500 of them was looking at me. And I said, this guy goes to the doctor. My topic was advocacy, becoming your own best personal advocate. That was the topic. And I looked at everybody and I said, this guy goes to the doctor. And right away I could see my host covering his eyes because I, I, I know he was thinking, <laughs> oh, my God, he's going to tell a joke. And I said, and he touches his neck. I touch my neck. And I say, doc, it really hurts me when I touch here. And you know, Doc, when I touch here, he touches his breastbone. This really hurts me. And he touches his abdomen. He says, and this, oh, this kills me, Doc, when I touch over here. And he touches his thigh. And even all along here, this really hurts me too, Doc. What is going on with me? The doctor says, Harry, we'll get to the bottom of it. We're going to do some lab. We're going to do some x-ray. I want you to come back tomorrow. I'll have all the results back. We'll get a good definitive clarity on what's going on with you. Harry leaves. He's very worried. He comes back the next day. He looks like a mess of nerves. He sits there. He says, well, 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 what'd you find, doctor? And the doctor looks at Harry and he says, Harry, you have a broken finger. And the humor there is that, you know, Harry's touching himself in these places and it hurts, but it only hurts because <laughs> his finger's broken. You know, and, but people are like that. They're myopic. They, they don't know. They can't touch themselves. It's like I ask women sometimes, do you touch your breast? Do you do breast massage? And they say, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what are you talking about? You let other people touch, but you don't touch? <laughs> Right. And, and they just look at me blankly and I say, you have to learn what's going on in your body. You have to touch yourself under your arms where you have lymph nodes and, and around the breast and around the neck. You have to become more, you know, body savvy as to, you know, how your body is signaling distress because your body is always broadcasting what's going on. Joint inflammation, pain. So a lot of us are just not hip to that and we need to become as part of a, a healing a healing modality but a sense of humor is critical for all this because it puts things into perspective is what it does it creates a better coping ability and that's what humor does it creates coping ability so it's really critical when i get my clients the clients that do worse in trying to heal themselves are those that cannot cultivate a sense of humor that's my observation after years so when i get something that's really serious they're going to be a lot of pain because I, I'm going to have to really work with them slowly and loosen them up and make them feel safe and throw some humor at them. And, 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 and then by doing that, you know, you see them relax and then you point that out and then you can explain it a little more thoroughly to people. But <clears throat> it's really important that we understand that humor is not about just telling jokes. It's about perspective that has more 
flexibility and adaptability to it. Uh, number seven is love and friendship. And this is, again, you can't, I mean, everything, there's so much, there's a plethora of information now written about the importance of self-love, the importance of loving support social, having a good social network around you. And that that's critical. That's really critical to see that how that affects the individual. Uh, when you're isolated and alone, it's more difficult. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult. So love and friendship is really critical. I had a woman come, come to me. She had ovarian cancer, early stage ovarian cancer. No, I'm sorry. She had uterine cancer. And she looked so sad. And she sat in front of me. I was At the time, I was in my late 30s. And she was in her late 70s. And she said, I have nobody to love. And I just looked at her. I remember thinking, are you kidding me? And she said, no, I'm just all alone. I have nobody to love in my life. Because I said, do you have a friendship? Do you have blah, blah? And she said, no, no, I have nobody. And I said, so what are you doing about that? She said, nothing. I'm just alone. I said, are you going to be that way for the rest of your life? And she looked at me almost indignantly. And I pulled out the LA Times from my desk, which had a, at the time a volunteer section, places you could volunteer. And I just pushed it in front of her. And I said, take a look at that. I said, that's where you're going to get love. She said, what do you mean? I said, you have to give more love. If you give more love, you will experience the loving process. And you might get some love back too, but you will have a whole different take on giving love, on a see, receiving love, on giving love. I said, you don't have love in your life? Start to give it. And it was almost condescending in the way I said it because I was so convicted about what I said. But that only makes more convincing because when you see somebody's really convicted about something, you figure there must be a measure of truth to it. And, uh, and she took my advice. And I got letter after letter every year from her saying, you know, this has been eventually a change into email, uh, which eventually just said, thank you so much. Volunteering has become a core part of who I am these days. It's given me great joy. I volunteer here. I volunteer there. And, that, and she, whatever she had was gone, you know, even, even though she amazing, made moderate right? changes, not yeah. earth changes. So you, who's to say this, you know, we, we think we know a lot, but that's the humbling point when we realize we know nothing. But of these characteristics, I do feel that they are really important. So love and friendship. Uh, and friendship, especially for men. You know, men are locked in this void of working, uh, pleasing your relationship, and you know, maintaining the status quo, and they let go of buddies. And as you get older, you realize you don't have any buddies, most men, and that you don't have the time to start creating buddyships. And it becomes this, this, you know, this circular complex that never allows you to get out of it until you get divorced or until you have some major tragedy happen to you. And then you start reaching out to people and you become more vulnerable and you start calling your buddies and say, Hey, you got some time for me. I'd like to talk to you. And suddenly you open up and you start realizing there's, there's a sense of completion and camaraderie. That's very nourishing being with your own gender. So I always encourage same gender friendships because I think they're really critical for our own development and to, to have sort of touchstones of your individual reality. Um, so love and friendship is under that category. We get, we get uh, three more. Uh, one is emotional equilibrium. And that, again, is about expressing how you feel. <clears throat> if it's important to you, I'm not talking about becoming indulgent and becoming an emotional chatterbox all the time, but it's when you are feeling slighted by somebody that's important to you, it's important you talk to them about it and not tiptoe around. And how many people tiptoe in their relationships? This is like the most stressful thing because they're always in this place of, you know, being alarmed that they might be rocking the boat. Um, and it's just, it's clearly not healthy. And that's clearly a sign. You're going to have to sit down with your partner and talk about why you don't feel safe, what you want to be able to talk about, how this needs to change because it's not serving you or the relationship. And if you're not growing together, you're growing apart. So it's really critical for emotionality to understand. It's not about expressing every little emotion, but those that happen to you inside that are important to you, you have to express them. And, you know, you have to really be conscious of what men do. This is not to bash men, but it is a, a almost a biological characteristic is men tend to get very logical when we start talking about emotions. Clara will say, you know, I'm scared of that. When you leave here at night, I get scared. Oh, don't be such a baby. There's nothing to be scared about. We're in a safe area. We're blah, blah, blah. He's given her logic. That's not a reason. That's not going to meet her emotional needs. What's going to meet the emotional needs is to go and say, honey, I'm not going to be far from you. 
and you know uh, I've, I'm here to support and love you and uh, and I know that you can weather whatever's going on remember that time you didn't blah 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 whatever you've got to find a way to connect emotionally with somebody like that and not just get them into the battlefield of the head and criticize them and win the argument and lose the sale because that's often what men do so we have to be really careful when we're arguing with men because we have to realize that it's just part of the culture for men we've learned to devalue emotions by arguing logic and, yeah and it's uh, more bonding when you can get to the emotion and bonding. share it rather than dismissing it incredibly bonding you know i created a men's seminar in the 80s called the men's seminar and it was before robert bly was in the drums banging and banging the drums in the woods and those men's seminars of that variety came out this is more an emotional seminar for a weekend and what we did with men was for three days we covered girlfriends and women in their lives we covered parents and we covered buddies and we, we did individual processes on all these things and by the you know the guys came in the first night they were sitting on the chairs backwards like baseball players and you know like tough guys and isolated and checking everybody out and judging everybody and by you know by sunday you know guys are in constant state of tears and they have their arms around each other and you know i got my buddy back and they're <laughs> because they, really they had, nice. it, admitted the stuff that was wrong with them and everybody else had been the same stuff and they realized we're all in the same boat you know and that's 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 the beginning of a real healing space because at least you're you're getting rid of that all that baggage that you hold because when you're upset conditionally you you create tension in your body and that has hormonal release that has influence chemically in your cell management everything it influences everything right so, so if you don't feel a, safe expressing that you internalize all that right and you also have to question you know how much safety you really need because sometimes you think you need more safety than you do need so uh it, it, there's two aspects of it one where you need to look at yourself and one where you need to look at you know what you're doing with others by not telling them what you need you know, all you're doing is you're arguing theory with people so it's really important um physical exercise is number nine and like i said before that's important because if you're making good blood from your diet you want to get it moving around your body and you do that via exercise via rubbing your body like with a towel like a loofah like a circulatory stimulant which helps lymph flow you do that with massage you do that with uh with walking or with stretching uh, we need to make the body far more active than it is we are so sedentary these days we sit for long hours we go from the car to the work to the bus to the couch nobody's standing anymore we are just we are in a state of only standing as a transport issue to get to the couch <laughs> so we need to get our body moving and really sweating again and what this all relates to is self-challenge, self-challenge, every day creating goals in different areas for yourself that you can really knock down and really feel when you go to bed at night, what did I do today that was, that was moving? What moved me into a healthier, more conscious place today? And for me, I, one day I, I opened the door at Macy's for a woman who had a bunch of bags she was carrying. This is one of the questions on my questionnaire. And she came through and uh i waited for her to say thank you and she didn't and for like one minute i just felt so pissed off i thought that ungrateful woman i held the door i had packages in my hand i mean that was my dialogue in my head you know i held this door i didn't have to hold the door blah 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 i went on and on for a good you know 30 seconds in my head and then i asked myself i thought the higher self stepped in and said no wait a second verona did you hold that door for the woman because you wanted thanks and you expected it or did you hold the door for the woman because that's who you are and I thought, that's who I am. And then I thought, well, what are you complaining about? This is who you are. Feel compassion for that woman because she's numb, because she's so wrapped up in whatever's going on in her head, she can't acknowledge somebody that's doing something kind for her. Compassion, not anger. And it right. made me think really how, how backwards we have all this arguing and anger. Um, so that's. I don't know how I got into that, but the point that I'm making is that you know when changing, when looking at things to change about ourselves, our perspective is critical. So it's not just about be more active. Being more, being more active is helpful, but one of the other aspects of health is more emotional, and we can't separate them. Um, but making sure that you are more active will ensure you of stronger will, will ensure you of more mental clarity, will ensure you of more physical patience 
so you have more endurance to seek a, some some healing remedy for the for the problem. So Very we're not we can't we can't separate that. And the last thing is faith. Uh, I love the George Bernard quote on faith. He says, "We've not lost faith. We've just transferred it from God to the medical profession." And the truth is, mm-hmm. we we definitely need more faith. And what that means has become a real area of study for me because I think faith <clears throat> comes from a sense of feeling grounded in yourself, uh, a sense of renewed perspective about life, uh, a sense of accepting that there is an invisible world. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, there is an invisible world. We know that molecularly. We know that through physics. We know that energetically. We know that things have an energy force. We know that trees radiate energy. We know that people radiate energy. And some people can even see the energy that falls into the sensory spectrum because there might be sharp. And they're, they're called aura readers. And that's, that's a potential. But we have to understand that uh, our faith is influenced by not only our perspective and our experience in life and our convictions and our self-reflection, it's experienced also by our sensitivity. And the more sensitive we create of a condition physically and mentally, the more sensitive we create this condition, the more we're likely to feel a deeper sense of faith. Uh, It also comes from intuition. You know, intuition, uh, I'm big on talking about intuition because my grandmother was a pretty well-known intuitive intuitive, uh, in the late 40s and the 50s. She used to do readings. She lived in the Bronx, and she had a little quiet practice. And and I remember she was reading some tea leaves to somebody, and I had left home early, and I moved in with her. And I, I said, you have to teach me how to read those tea leaves. And she said, you know what? I really don't even read the tea leaves. I just look at people I know. I just use the leaves because they want to know that I'm looking at something to figure all this out. Oh, you know? that's really and, interesting. And when I, when I left home and I appeared at 10 o'clock at night on her, in front of her door on the fourth floor of a Bronx tenement, she had her door open, standing in the doorway. She had the bed made and she had tea she had made for me brewing. Uh, and she knew I was coming and she had no way of knowing that I was coming. She had no contact with anybody I knew in California. She had no idea. And yet intuitively she knew. So, what, what she taught me, and I could, just, I could express this very briefly, is that there is a voice that talks to us constantly. It's our intuitive voice. And among the different voices in our heads, the voice of uh, intuition, the voice of our parents, the, the voice of our critic, or the voice of uh, our angry voice, there are many voices that we are constantly hearing. But there is an intuitive voice. Sometimes if you're looking for an address and something says, you know, make left, and you make a left, and then you find the resident, go back and think. How did that voice sound? It's always a calm voice. It's never like, make a left, you idiot. Right. It's, kind of <laughs> it's, it's always a, a very calm that says, you might want to make a left. It's like having Clint Eastwood in your ear saying, I'd make a left if I were you. Uh, <laughs> and, and you make that left and you find it and you think, wow. Well, the more you can go back and recall how you felt, what the voice sounded like, its tone, its timbre, the more you'll recognize it. And then the fun with intuition really begins because then intuition is about asking yourself questions and seizing that response when you hear it. And it can become a real source of joy. And it has for me, and I believe that's part of the invisible world because that, that is uh, a larger connection we have with something that can't be seen. Um, your relationship with God or, or with the universe or with the almighty spirit, it has to be somewhat individual. So that's not to devalue anything you might feel for any particular religious group or organization, but that's an additional part. What I have observed over the years is that my religious clients, whether they're Orthodox Jews, whether they're holy Christians, or devout Christians, or whether they're Mormons, have done incredibly well, way beyond anybody else. Regardless of the religion, if they're religious types, they usually do much better. They just have a greater sense of faith. They have a deeper sense of accountability. Uh, they have a, a stronger drive to, to represent their ideals of what religion is through their work and who they are. So they usually do better. So when I get a client and they're religious, I don't care what religion they are, they usually do really well if they're open to change. Uh, so faith can't be devalued. Faith is a really important characteristic. And that, in a nutshell, I mean, there are other side aspects like gratitude and what have you, forgiveness. That's really critical. I'm, one of the major quotes that I use when I teach is a quote from Mark Twain. And Twain used to say, forgiveness 
is the fragrance of the violet on the heel that has crushed it. Meaning that violet that's been crushed and thus its life ended is still going to radiate perfume. It's still giving. And I love that quote. It's beautiful. It's a, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a great visual about forget the meaning of forgiveness. It means to keep on giving. And uh, because there's no redemption and there's no real healing in holding on, in blaming, in finger pointing, you know, in making someone else accountable for your oversight or your inability to see something larger. You know, I had a friend the other day who was complaining about somebody he borrowed $150 from this from, from my friend and he never gave it back. And I said, Lou, it cost you $150 to find out who this guy was. You've got to be happy that you got that education and you, that you didn't loan him $2,000 as you originally were going to loan him. Uh, you got away with 150 for a quick education. You got to find a way to look at things so they're healthier for you. Anyway, and then in a let nutshell, them go, right? Yeah, and then let them go and say, you know what? I hope you have a good journey. I hope you get it together, and I hope you can give my twenty dollars back someday from a place of wanting to, not from a place of me coercing you to doing it. Uh, or else so, it interferes with your joy, right? So it, it's really about getting so. back to the joy, and I think it's you, a little. You can't laugh animal. if you're angry, right? I think it's more difficult to laugh if you're angry. Let's put it that way, as opposed mm-hmm. to thinking black and white. Yeah, it's more difficult. And, you know, the people I see healing themselves are people who are actively engaged in everything. It's like they're cleaning up their homes. They're getting rid of all their junk they had for years and not doing They're taking care of their taxes, which they've ignored and tried to skate. They're paying debts, which they've been ignoring. They're, <clears throat> they're paying more attention to their children. They're looking more interested in their relationship. They're, they're trying at all levels to become more human friendly and more attentive and at the same time more expressive in how they feel and how they nourish themselves because nourishment is not just biochemicals not just through what you eat so therefore but the problem i have is with people who are only nourishing themselves psychologically and saying i'm going to heal with god with my relationship i'm going to heal with my way i'm thinking and i'm going to eat whatever i want i don't think that's going to happen I think you have to look at the Trinity, body, mind, and spirit, and pay attention to all those factors. So in my book, the first 40 pages of my new edition, which came out in 2014, is devoted to looking at the first 40 pages of the book, all these factors, which are really kind of non-food factors. What are they? And how do we look at them? And what are good examples of what these look like? And for anybody, just whether you, you don't have to be in a state where you need healing. You can just be in a state where you need more wholeness in your life. And I think right, because I guess we're all good in some areas and lacking in others, so it's about figuring out where you need to focus. Right, right, exactly. So many amazing things to think about. Yeah, there are. And, you know, then also, you know, there's an all interesting aspect of diagnosis, too. Uh, and I write about this in the book as well. You know, what are the diagnostic characteristics that you should be aware of that something is that your body is broadcasting something is wrong or something is off balance let's put it that way and some of those factors i'll just throw a couple of these briefly here our appetite what kind of appetite do you have i use this as a major criteria for examining an individual's whole condition what kind of appetite do they for curiosity do they ask me questions are they interested in what's going on around them in life in the world you know, do they do they want to learn? See, sometimes our lack of energy is behind the poor appetite. We don't have the appetite to learn about what's going on in the world because we're so internalized with what's going on with us. Sometimes becoming more externalized can help that internal process because it becomes less stressful. You know, is their bowel movement regular? Bowel movement is, needs to be regular. And you need to eat in a way that has enough fiber to give you that regularity, which is not a very difficult thing to do. How's your sleep quality? Your sleep quality also tells us about your health. If you have good active days, it's more than likely you'll have a deep restful night. If you have a deep restful night, you'll have more energy to have a more active day. And it'll influence our mood. What kind of moods do we have? Our cravings. You know, I'll tell you real briefly about sweet cravings. I get a lot of people who come to see me, and they know that I'm not big on recommending a lot of sweets. But I'll say to them, it's not about don't eat sugar. It's about Try not to do things that will inspire sugar cravings. And what some of those things might be, and I have a whole list of these on my website, uh, vernverona.com. Um, and there's, I think, 12 different things about sugar, 10 different sugar characteristics. One of them is not waiting long times between your meals. 
if you wait a long time between your meals, your blood sugar drops. And that means your muscles are getting that sugar. And eventually that sugar goes away. You don't have sugar. You become in a low blood sugar state. And you're more likely to crave a fast sort of simple sugar at that point. And to the point where, to the degree that it's like, it's, you can't avoid it. You have to have it. It's really you know, true. When, I just did that the other day. I went a week without sugar. I waited right. too long to eat lunch. And I tried to have fish and vegetables. And I just wasn't recovering. Oh, I, had, right. well, I had some chocolate then. Right. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't recover. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that, I knew that, I, and I was angry at myself. I said, see, I can't wait to eat. It was just one of those things. But I learned. Right. right. Well, good. Well, then you don't have to be angry. But the real issue is that, you know, if you don't eat and you go shopping, you know, you will literally, if you're hungry enough, you'll start carrying open bags, and, you know, going beyond your ethics and saying, I can right. eat it now and pay for it later. And by the time you get to the counter, your eyes are glassy and you're tired and you think, just just take this out of my card, will you? So, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you need to, we need to become aware of what fosters cravings. And blood sugar management is one of the major factors behind cravings, as well as animal protein. If you want to stop eating sugar, it's more than likely you're going to have to severely reduce animal protein because it's one of the reasons we crave sugar. The more animal protein you eat, the more sugar you crave. The more sugar you eat, the more animal protein you crave. Oh, I didn't know there was a connection. There is a major connection. Also, there's a nutritional connection because protein has um, almost really no carbohydrate. There's no carbohydrate in protein, and carbohydrate has no protein in it. So in its own weird, balanced, extreme way, if you look at fast food, that's what fast food is. It's basically meat and sugar. You know, throw in a couple of fried potatoes on the side. Uh, so, you know, that's not really a healthy way of, of operating. And right. it will create all kinds of cravings. And once you have that sugar, then you're not satisfied because then you feel bloated and you feel tired and you want to just drink a lot of fluid. And then you have trouble breathing and you just want to lie down. So, so really, there's, there's, it's really important to understand how cravings affect you. And I talk about that in the book, on the website, and it's a big part of my counseling uh, energy, your energy level. That's one of the first ways that we gauge an individual's health is by energy. How much energy? I'm not talking about somebody who's like off the charts when you meet them. That's like caffeine extraordinaire. But I'm talking about somebody that's got energy and they look at you and you could feel their eyes entering you and they have a sense of enthusiasm and they're listening and they feel present. That's energy condensed. And you see less and less of that. I see, especially in kids, you see less and less of that. Um, stress levels, pain. I mean, we're, so many people are in pain all the time. That's a diagnostic sign. That's a sign that something is off. If you could take your hand and put it into your abdomen right beside your belly button, maybe four or five inches to the, each side, and press really deeply, and if you have any pain in there, you need to change your diet because you should have no abdominal pain. Yeah, and if anybody thinks you should, I could change your diet for you, and you can see in two or three weeks that you have no pain unless you have a, a major mass there. So really, your body is talking to you constantly. And that's really what we're saying, because the state of cancer, the state of disease, is a very progressed state that we have allowed to move. Um, and it's already a highly exaggerated state. So all these things build up toward that, I believe. So we have so to listen on the way. I'm sorry? Listen, listen on the way to our bodies. I think, I think yeah, we, there are a exactly. lot of signs that we just ignore and try and there put are. a band yeah. on. Yeah. But, but even when you see change, like for instance, I directed this film in 2006. We never completed the film. We completed the medical aspect of the film, but we had problems with investors and we had problems with our crew. Still there? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. I thought I lost you. We had problems with our crew and we ended up halting production, but we got the medical experiment together. Half the film was we selected with Dr. Terry Shantani in Hawaii, who's an old friend of mine and a wonderful doctor, uh, author. He wrote a wonderful book called The Peace Diet. And uh, he's been known as the disease-reversing doctor for years. And he's an old associate of mine. And anyway, we talked, and I said, well, I want to do this film with you, Terry. Let's get a bunch of people, and let's feed them really well. And let's observe them and do medical, medical lab before and after and see if there's any changes. And what we ended up doing was we gave a lecture in Hawaii. We attracted 1,800 people. From that lecture, we pulled 150 volunteers. And from that, we narrowed it down to 35, 30 people. And those 30 people became our project. And for, for four weeks, we, they met us in the morning. And we took lab and blood work. And then we gave them breakfast. We gave them a packed lunch. We let them go. They came back for dinner. 
We gave him dinner. We weighed and we, we uh, took blood samples of those that were diabetic. And uh, we did labs before we started the experiment and we did major labs after the experiment. In four weeks, we found this. Half the diabetics, half the, half the number was diabetic. Mostly all the diabetics threw away insulin. Some of them were taking over 100 units a day. Eating a grain, bean, vegetable diet, a la my program, they were able to get off that medication very quickly because the medication lowers blood sugar. And if they're eating a diet that does that, the medication can actually become fatal. So that's why we needed physician monitoring to look at them, take blood pressure, and look at their symptoms every day and to say at some point, okay, we need to get, start lowering the insulin here because you're still having too much insulin. Um, or we need to get off the blood pressure medication because you know, I don't think you need it anymore. And they would say, are you kidding? Are you, I can't, I've been on it for 12 years. Just get off of it. And it, it was shocking that people were able to get off of it. So, and we took pictures of them every day. So by the end of four, I think it was actually, we extended it for two weeks additional. By the end of six weeks, People had all A1C levels, that's your sugar levels, normalized, who had diabetes. Unbelievable. People who were type 2 diabetics were off of all medication, no insulin whatsoever, people taking up to 100 units a day. People who are arthritic had no pain. Uh, people who had inflammatory conditions, gone. It was amazing. Even with a guy that kept urinating, he had a urinary, he had almost an incontinence problem. It was, it was healed after four weeks. It was amazing. But here's what happened. After four months, because we had to leave Hawaii eventually, after four months, after six months, most of the people went back to their old way of eating. And we were shocked. The core group of us, you know, the people I hired to, to be my co-producer, my, my DP, my director of photography, we were all shocked because what we realized was that their social situation was so entwined with food. You know, Hawaii, the barbecue is a really big deal. The family barbecues and the eating out. And they felt so isolated and ostracized and not a part of the social movement, to them, it was not worth it. It was just worth it to eat. At least they were eating with their family and eating when everybody else was. Some of them since this is 2006 have died, sadly, and I do feel their death could have been prevented, but we didn't have that social factor in place. So it's not just about food. I think food is foundational, but you can't disavow these other factors. They're really critical. Yeah, I find that too because our culture – the Western diet, I mean, you're trying to connect with people and eat out. There's nowhere to eat out that has healthy food. and There are some choices that we can make that are healthy when we eat out. Um, we can eat cultural foods, and we can get better whole food. There are you know, choices we can make in restaurants. And by telling them what we want, you know, I, 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 when I go to a Chinese restaurant, and I say I want some vegetables, they, they're going to give me really oily vegetables. And I say I want them steamed. Or sometimes I'll say I want a little oil. And they say, okay. And I'll say, no, no, wait, before you leave. Sometimes you use a lot of oil. Little oil means maybe, can you use like one teaspoon of oil? Oh, no, you have no taste. No, no, I don't care about taste. I find taste, no problem. And then I say no MSG. And they say, oh, MSG, just a little bit because it makes taste. I say, no, no, I don't care. I have taste in my mouth. It's okay. I don't need extra taste. <laughs> I, now, one time I said to this guy, I said, I have, I have heart problem. If I have MSG, I have heart problem. I fall down. Then, no pay. <laughs> no pay, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, he was, I didn't great. know he was like, I didn't know he was getting his doctorate. He was like really smart. And he looked at me and said, I got what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, you know, you've got to order what you know will resonate with your body. And the only way to do that is to try a certain way of eating for a little while and see for yourself. And that's what I love about the work I do because I know if people follow what I'm recommending, they're going to feel massively different. Is it going to be exactly what they need? Probably not. But it's going to be enough to tune them up so they can hear slight imperfections and adjust them themselves. You know? And that's really what we need. We, we need that experience because that experience is what gives you real conviction. It's not just intellectual belief. Oh, I must need B12. No, it's about you feeling, no, no, when I eat this way, I have a daily bowel movement. I have deep breath. I have lots of energy. When I'm drinking a lot of coffee, I don't have that much energy. Then they know, but you have to get that experience because at some point it's all theory and you can go crazy with theory. And that's why when I go to nutritional conferences and I hear people talking about minutia, now, you need your little, that little tiny trace mineral. You've got to get that in there. Now, I have a package here with that trace mineral for $11.95. It'll get you. 
I, you know, when I hear all that stuff, it's like, okay, that's relative on some level for some people, but let's look at the larger picture. And we're not doing that a lot. So I think that's, that's an area that needs attention. So listen to your body, back to the intuition. Whole food diet. You know, making yeah, daily I know choices. I feel better when I juice in the morning rather than just having coffee with chocolate. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's when you go on vacation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so much easier when the sun is shining, too, and you have those well, feel-good chemicals from the sun. It just sets the tone. I know, but you know what? What about well, – I, I lived in Vancouver for many years, so – and I spent many years living in Vancouver, looking up at the sky every morning, thinking, I know above that cloud cover, there's a sun somewhere there. But I still did not have the appreciation. I did not have the ability to experience the sun as I wanted to. What about people in that, in that climate? You know, I mean, not everybody can be in Hawaii or California and enjoy year-round sun. Um, and there's something to say for a foreseen envi- foreseen environment and how it affects us. It does affect us in a very positive way if it's not extreme. Um, I just think we have to, it's like that cancer client once said to me, he said, every day is sunny for me. Uh, We have to find ways of looking at things in a a more positive light. And yes, the influence of sun is is positive, but uh, not all of us can afford that. And if we can't afford that, then we have to find other ways to create sunshine in our lives. Right, absolutely. I like the yoga pose idea too. Yes. Yeah. Oh, actually, it's, it's starting. To, it was. It's a work that I developed. It's a. It's a separate book, um, and we call it 412 Yoga, which is four positions, 12 minutes. And the idea is, you know, you can take any four positions in yoga and do them. Uh, you don't have to do a whole set, but if you do at least four positions, you can feel benefit from that, and that will further encourage you to want to do more when you can find the time. As right. opposed to doing all or nothing. We would do, sometimes we do, no, if I'm not going to get my yoga clothes, roll up my mat and go to the yoga place downtown uh, and come back and do the whole three-hour thing, then I'm not going to do yoga at all. Right. <laughs> we, just get get some, we get some punishing. Yeah. Yeah, we get some punishing about it. So it there's got to be some shades of gray there, you know. Yeah, that's great. So, I, you know, we look forward to seeing that if you're writing that. That would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Now, overall, I, I like what Mark Twain said, although I think Mark Twain could have used some nutritional counseling. But what Mark Twain said, he said, eat what you want and let the food fight it out. And I think that applies in, in a general sense for, you know, when you have a good, healthy way of eating, you don't have to worry about all the minutiae. You can, you know, fudge a little bit here and there. You could be flexible if you have that pattern. And what that means is you have to understand how this works. You have to study it, you know. Buy my book. Or buy the Macrobiotics for Dummies book or, you know, buy a book that's going to give you some idea of food groups and what to eat and experiment with doing that and find out if that works for you. you that, you're only going to find out once you experiment. And then you'll know. You'll know from your own experience. And that's the best teacher of all. So experiment and, then, and listen to your body. Yes. You just can't listen to your body, though, because your body might say, I want milk. And that might mean you're craving something from the past. It could be a sentimental craving. Maybe you're craving something in the milk that you can get from other sources. So okay. you need a period of abstention from certain foods that are not health supportive to show yourself that you can do without them. Okay, and for me, those foods, you know, for me, those foods are dairy foods, heavy fat, uh, animal, a lot of animal protein. I think we can really minimize our animal protein and, uh, we can have a really different approach. And, you know, your body is incredibly forgiving. You can see changes in your health in two weeks, enough for you to know, wow, this is making a difference. And then what happens psychologically is you have a greater sense of control. It's really incredible the way you feel. You Suddenly you feel like, wow, I can control my health. And it just gives you a, a different kind of confidence that can be very attractive and, and very strengthening for yourself. Yeah, the control is important because I think the cancer industry likes everyone to think that they don't have any control and this was a chance happening. So when you really feel like choice controls your body and the outcomes, it's empowering. I think that's really important. It is empowering. And the education we need is to understand that, you know, when they're looking at a tumor reducing, they're looking at what they call tumor response rate. They're not looking at how the patient responds. Well, the patient died, but that tumor got smaller. It was successful that kind of thing. And that's, 
it's not the result of doctors not wanting to help us. It's the result of ignorance. And it's the right. result of a perspective that's a partial perspective. Um, so, you know, for all its merit, uh, there's some wonderful aspects of Western medicine. And even I've had a lot of clients do short-term chemo that have done great on short-term chemo because they did alternative before and they did alternative after. And for some, for progressive stages, sometimes that could be helpful. I made a living for years telling people don't even go near chemo, but I realized after counseling, you know, hundreds of women that had, for instance, breast cancers, a lot of them did really well with short-term chemo when they didn't uh, prior. Then they were doing alternative stuff. They were feeling better in their body. One woman came to see me. She said, my tumor is reducing with alternative medicine. And what she found out was the tumor wasn't reducing. It was just the water and the fat weight of the tumor was diminishing. But the solid, the solidity of cancer cells that were in mass there, that was still there. And the cancer was actually increased in its stage. And then she ended up doing short-term chemo. And she got off of it, and she sailed through with very little side effects. She was doing some Chinese herbs and acupuncture at the same time, and she did really well. So I changed my views on that. That's not to say I'm a big advocate of chemotherapy, but for certain cancers, sometimes for short term, it could be helpful. So okay. and again, it's not a it's not a one size fits all, but it's you know there are aspects of Western medicine we can selectively use in certain circumstances if they're extreme uh, that can support us. And then we can go back to alternative to sort of cap it off. So we've got a lot of tools in front of us. We just have to reach out, educate ourselves, and begin to make some kind of change. It's the only way we're going to find out. Yeah, that, that's really great advice. Thank you. I love all the things that you've – it's just so much food for thought to think about um, as far as – It could be – what happens, what happens when you hear food for thought to think about some people, they get overwhelmed, and they don't know where to start. My and wheels are turning. <laughs> I, yeah. I think well, it's all good, though. Okay, I think it's good because it gets you motivated to think more. So the next step is further education. So you buy the book. I'm not just trying to sell my books, but I'm just saying you buy whatever book or whatever material you need to get better educated so you have the material in front of you, but then you have to do the technique, which means you – change the diet, you change some of the lifestyle, you change some of the thinking, you start thinking about your social scale, you start thinking about how you spend your time and what are you really getting out of the time you spend. And, you know, it's important to make another $30,000 a year if you're going to be miserable and feel like jumping off a roof all the time. Right. Um, you know, I was in a relationship with somebody who, you know, free, she hated what she did. She was in, she was, uh, she was a physician and she woke up every morning saying, I can't, I'm not, I can't go to work today. I can't stand it. I don't want to go to work today. And I thought, this is like living with an 11 year old who gets up and says, you know, I don't want to go to school. You know? Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, how can you go to, how can you go there all day long? And I dread every minute and hide out. You can't. So it's yeah, not that's healthy. not healthy. Yeah. But we have to really reassess what we're doing and, you know, there's so many new opportunities available to work for people and to create businesses and do online stuff. There's really no excuse except for a lack of imagination that we can use to sort of reorient and change our lives again. Yeah, I think we just get stuck. So that's a good wake up call. Yeah, yeah, we do get stuck. And uh, it's easy when you get stuck to stay doing the same thing over and over again, because on one level, it's safe. But the truth is, it's not safe because we know we're miserable and misery is not safety. Misery is misery. No, and it feels like the be... path of least resistance, but there's all that stress it's causing every day that it's a low right. level stress. that's always there. So why not relieve it? It's always there and it's accumulative. Right. So I, I do think that needs to change. And I, you know, I, when I got into counseling, I thought I'm just going to advise people on diet and I ended up like, doing like 70% psychological stuff and 30% diet. And that's when I started seeing it make a difference in people. So yes, it was humbling for me like because I, I, yeah. And I, it was humbling for me because I realized, well, I, there's things I need to change too, because clients are a mirror for you to realize things about your own life. And then when I do those things and I have a positive experience and I tell clients that experience, they have a positive experience because they can feel my conviction. Right. And they think, oh, that makes a good idea. That feels good. I'm going to try that. So that and that becomes more rewarding for me because then I I get feedback from them saying, hey, that really worked. And then I think, oh, great, that's cool. That that's applicable. So sure. that's what we need more of. We need more of that spirit. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, there's 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 a lot of food for thought here, and a, a lot of great points. These the traits that we went over, I think, were really amazing, um, really great things to think about. Thank you. So, so I encourage everyone to go over them again and really think about incorporating incorporating these traits into your life. Actually, on my website, um, vernverona.com, V-E-R-N-E-V-A-R-O-N-A.com, uh, there's a download, there's a bunch of article downloads, and there's one called Alternative Medicine, and I think you could find in Alternative Medicine the characteristics that are positive, that, that, that people are are getting benefit from, and also the diagnostic characteristics. Um, what are the 12 things that people are, that are 12 different ways you could read your body? And that might be interesting for people to read. And plus there's a, a, a handout PDF there about sugar cravings. What are the factors behind sugar cravings? And that makes it easier. Once you understand there are some physical and some psychological, it makes it easy to construct a life where you are not constantly facing sugar cravings. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone should definitely check your website. That's really great information. Thank you. And then they can also check your book, Nature's Cancer Fighting Foods and yes. Macrobiotics for Dummies. Yes, absolutely. And I always offer this because nobody ever calls me, so it's great. It works out perfect. But I always, <laughs> not nobody, but I always offer, if people have questions and they can't find, they can't find an answer, either in the books or on the website, then they're welcome to email me. And uh, my responses are usually kind of brief, but I'll always answer an email. So it's oh, that's my wonderful. initials. It's, it's vv at vernverona.com. Vv, like victory, victory, at my name, V-E-R-N-E-V-A-R-O-N-A.com. They're welcome to uh, send me an email. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you. And you have counseling services also, and I do some counseling. About maybe 25% of my time is with Skype counseling, and uh, it's I usually do two session uh, two session um, appointment. And I can't watch a clock; it's hard to watch a clock with this kind of stuff. But I do a two session appointment, and then I do a couple of weeks of follow up thereafter. And I send a whole bunch of PDFs to people so that they have strong educational support at the same time. And we make it comprehensive and personalized. Uh, if it can't be personalized, then you're just giving generics, and right. that's not really going to help. So I try to personalize it, and uh, I make it affordable, and, and I make it fun. And that's, that's where it should be. It should be fun. Absolutely. As opposed and then they to, can also check your blog, too. You have a blog on your website? Yes, I do. And uh, I think I have a blog coming up next this week about textures and diet. You know, sometimes we eat by texture. We don't even realize that's what we're looking for in a diet. Like if you have a French onion soup, there are usually croutons in the soup. And for a thin soup to have a couple of croutons that are crunchy, it's a nice change of variety. If you order chop suey in a restaurant, they'll always give you dry noodles that you crunch up and throw in the chop suey. Right. You know, that's, that's a part of textures or a part of culinary styles that we've really forgotten. And the more variety of text you have in your meal, the more satisfied you're going to be. Right. So that's a that's a, a nice blog that's coming out next week uh, about textures and how to get those textures in your diet. Ooh, right that's now, I really have a, a blog. On, the blog I have on there right now is about taste, the different tastes in diet. So you have your sour taste, your sweet taste, your salty taste, your bitter taste, and your pungent taste. And the more variety of those tastes we get in our diet, the more satisfied we'll feel as well. Like if you make I, greens, if I you did steam see that broccoli, on your website. I thought that was really you interesting. Thank you. Well, the, and the example I want to leave the read the listeners with it is if you have some broccoli and you just steam it up, that could be pretty boring for some people. But if you take a little soy sauce and you mix it with a little lemon juice, you now have a sour taste and a salty taste, which is actually a really nice combination. And you sprinkle it on the broccoli a little bit. And now you have sweet from the broccoli because broccoli is a sweet green. Yes, it sour is. from the lemon and salty from the – you have three different tastes. And the more variety of taste you have in your, in your diet – the more satisfied you'll become. So it's, really it's to think about taste is really interesting because it changes the scope of uh, your food selection. I'm always looking for texture. Like I would even mm -hmm. sprinkle sesame seeds then so I have a little more crunch. Or Right, right. I love exactly. color and crunch. And... Right. Well, color yeah. is about visual appetite, you know, and that's something a lot of us don't think about. But in the Western diet, we all fill our plates with all kinds of food. But, you know, leaving a little space on the plate is really important too. 
and having some kind of color semblance. Like if you have lentils and you put them in a brown bowl, one of my teachers used to say that looks like a bowel movement. So, right. <laughs> so the idea is why not chop a carrot up and put a little parsley in there? Because there is a psychological appetite as well. So make your food attractive looking. You know, even if you're just cooking for yourself, make it attractive looking. Put a napkin down, put your food implement down, get a nice bowl, make it attractive as if you're like cooking for a special guest because you are special. So you're cooking for a special guest. It's yeah, I find more I'm more satisfied then, and then I'm not looking for something after because it's already right. enough. There was color, right, exactly. there was crunch, it was it was good to look at, it was appetizing. Right, right. Then you don't need anything else. If you have the lentils yeah. in the brown bowl and you're done, you're like, oh, yeah, I need something else. I need, else. Something else. <laughs> I, need a, I need a cookie. <laughs> right, because that just wasn't, it just didn't do enough. Right, right. And that's another reason why a little bit of hot tea after a meal, you know, a mild non-caffeinated tea can actually help stop your appetite. So it's really great when I deal with weight loss, I can tell, I recommend to people, have a little bit of hot tea after a meal, it stops your appetite. And uh, it makes a huge difference for them. Yeah, doesn't, isn't mint good for that, mint tea? Uh, supposedly, yes, but uh, it is a floral tea. And as a floral tea, it tends to be a little on the acid side. So for certain people who are tend to be more acid in, in their excesses, I would probably ah. recommend minimum minimizing the tea and not having it every day, but just having it once in a while. I Very like the teas that are not fragrant, like dandelion tea or the popular macrobiotic twig tea or uh, rooibos tea or pau de arco tea. There are a number of teas that are real health-providing, but they don't have strong fragrances. And right. uh, without that, they tend to be a little hardier in terms of what they do for you. Very interesting. Boy, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> might have overwhelmed you. <laughs> no, it's, it's but all But still, great. when you hang up, still, when you hang up, you're going to say, oh, wow, I need a drink. <laughs> I am getting hungry. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I might even have lentils. <laughs> there you go. Just watch that bowl color, that's all. <laughs> I have sprouted lentils. I think I'm, I might try that tonight. Oh, good, good. That sounds good. Well, thank you so and, much. And, you know, and the last, the last thing is, the last thing I want to encourage, especially men, is to learn how to cook, man. Just, gee, stop depending on people to be your mommy and make food for you. We need to learn how to present, how to prepare. And if you want to turn a woman on, by the way, fellas, it's, it's a great thing to do to just say, come on over and cook a three course meal, you know, that you whipped up that's somewhat balanced and healthy and that'll impress anybody. Uh, yeah, again, we don't do I'd impress be impressed. people, but there you go. <laughs> but we do it because, you know, it's part of, it's part of how we express ourselves and how part of how we give love. And, uh, it's a neat skill to have. And for years I faked it. I just faked it. And, uh, you know, I, I was in a seminar once talking about beans, and somebody said, <clears throat> how long do you cook your beans? And I said, oh, 20, 30 minutes. And then he said, it was a pause, and he said, what kind of beans do you eat? <laughs> I realized <laughs> I better stop lying, and I better start learning how to cook. And that was like in the 70s, and I, and I, I actually did a trade with somebody. And I learned how to cook, and it's great. It's just half the problem of cooking when you're lying around thinking, what can I eat? And I don't feel like cooking is just because you don't feel inspired. And if you have dishes in your mind and you have a good knife and you have a fun apron and even a chef's hat to play the whole game, uh, you can get into it very quickly. So it's neat to create the opportunity to do that. Uh, and that means you have to learn how to cook. And it's not so hard. It's really easy. It is. And you have to eat. So I, I really think you do have to learn to cook. Right. I agree. Or else you're eating processed things and quick things. Yeah, and, and then you're not feeling good about it at the time you're eating it, and you're not feeling good about it later. And right. you're spending all your money on box stuff, which is, like, just prohibitively expensive. Right. And you get to so, create. Agree. So that's... Yes. That's yep. Never, list, never, never miss an opportunity to be creative. Wonderful. That's great advice. Well, thank you so much, Vern. This was wonderful, and... I think everyone should check out your website and your book and your blogs. And if they need counseling, they can go on your website feel and feel free to email you also any questions. Right. And everyone Thank should you. concentrate on those essential traits for healing 
it was that was really valuable information. So we thank you so thank much you. for that. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, and uh, thanks for letting me talk. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. You're so welcome. And it was great to have you. Thank you very much. You I wish you well. Lot. And they'll so so we can end here, and then you know they'll edit out anything you know. That, okay, good, good. That's great. Whatever, but that that was, was really that okay? great. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay. I threw, a, I threw a lot. I'm just sitting in my car here, I'm thinking uh, I'm just throwing things there. So I hope that is okay. Well, it, it was it was great to listen to. Good conversation, and um, okay. those traits were wonderful. And I have Thank such you. a craving for lentils right now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually a very long lecture that I give. It's like a full day talk when I go over each of these traits and I give examples and we have discussions about them and we have a lot of fun with them. So it's actually uh, to condense it into an hour or so. It's really, it's a whole nother number, but I'm glad I was able to talk about it because I do think it's really important. Uh, well, you know, I everybody's think, focused you know, at least on, we planted the seed. Yes. So absolutely. I think, I think it's a you, big seed to plant. Yeah, it is. What kind of numbers do you reach with your with your show? Um, our Facebook page and website they're they're big numbers. I I don't know offhand to tell you the truth. Okay, good. Well, anytime you want to talk further, let me know. I'm always. Available. I know Nikki knows actually, if you you know if you want to send her an email, no, she can not, let you know. Important. But it's not it's not important. But um, I'm around. I'm actually. I'm not. Are you doing a cruise? Much. I saw. Well, I'm doing a Weight Watcher cruise in uh, the beginning of May, but I'm actually moving for the next three to six months to Costa Rica uh, wow. to do some research and to do some work. And uh, and I got some writing due and I've got a nice situation out there I can go to. So I'm going to go. And it's a blue zone area. It's really beautiful out there. And um, it's on the West Coast. And so, but I'm still, you know, with all the media around, I'm still available. So feel free to call if you want to do something in the future. I'm always open to doing something. Wonderful. Yeah, of, that would be wonderful. You Thank you. So, I loved all the topics. It was hard to pick one, but. Thanks. You know, we we're, there's just so much about the food and supplements, and there's not a lot about the more. I know, fundamental. The spiritual, the psychological, the things that are not so tangible. It's just. It's, there's just not as much there. So when I saw that topic, I thought, yeah, let's do that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and the truth is, on what is there about those topics, usually so complicated and technical, uh, it's just um, sometimes it just makes you feel like, you know, it's just too much. It's just right. Too much. right. So. Well, good. Well, thanks for the time, Debbie. I appreciate that. And I wish Thank you, you well. Thank you so much for your time. And um, we'll let you know when the podcast me- comes up. Oh, please do, and uh, send me your email. Send me an e- personal email when you get a chance, vv at com, and I'll send you some of my PDFs so you can read them. Okay, wonderful. Okay, just remind me. Just say, looking forward to your PDFs, Vern, and I'll, <laughs> I'll know. Okay. Oh, yeah, I told I was gonna I'll definitely right. do that. Good, and be well, and I look Thank forward to Thank you so you much. Sometime. Thanks. I'm going to go have a vegan dinner right now. <laughs> I'm uh, doing, <laughs> you I'm doing well. sprouted lentils and veggies. Good. You will. Thank you so much. You have a great night. Thanks so much. Bye, David. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beat Cancer Answer. If you learned just one thing today about how to prevent, cope with, or beat cancer, then we have succeeded in our mission. For more information or assistance, visit our website at beatcancer.org. Remember to sign up for our educational email series and get your free gift. Join in the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, or Google+, where you can meet others who think just like you. We appreciate all of your feedback and love your suggestions. Please also remember to rate us on iTunes. Your positive ratings help us to get discovered so we can save more lives. Thank you again for listening, and best wishes for good health from all of us at BeatCancer.org.